How's it going today? This is Charles Neal, your host of Coffee Talk, and we'd like to welcome you to our latest episode. Today, we have Asif Sadiq, who is uh, Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for Warner Brothers Discovery. Asif, how's it going? Great, great. Nice to <laughs> nice to join you today. Yeah, it's good to have you. Listen, let's, let's, let's get in there, Asif. So, Asif, you have a unique blend. Um, one, one of the benefits I get of, 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 of having all these different conversations, I get to do research on, 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 on leaders. And I see that, you know, you don't just have the, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, a theoretical knowledge of diversity and inclusion and all of the standards that go in. You do because you sit on a couple of boards, you sit on uh, uh, university councils, et cetera. But you also obviously are in practice with, with, with leading large, not just large teams, but large global teams over decades. And I'm not trying to aid you in that. <laughs> you for decades, right? And so I want to get a better sense of where did that passion and drive come from? Because, you you know, you have Warner Brothers Discovery, you have Adidas, you have Reebok, you have Ernest & Young, and all of these various organizations in there. There has to be some level of passion and drive that has fueled you from early on that lets you do this on a daily basis. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And, and, and thank you. Yeah, it's, it's you know, I mean, it's it's been a long time uh, of working in this space and you know um it, it's it's fascinating from, from two 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 pieces like firstly being able to have the you know the theory and the practical piece which, which is which is great in fact I've, I've got a book coming up this is where i'll pitch my book next year um which is all about diversity and inclusion theory into practice so how do okay. we bring to life some of that stuff um but actually to, to your point what where did the drive start from where did this whole sort of you know wanting to do do stuff because i can promise you when i started doing diversity it wasn't even a thing you know diversity at the time was seen as hey we'll hand out a few balloons and a few keychains or key fobs and that was diversity done right like hey we've done our job let's go back in um but for me it's really started um when i was you know finishing college university and um, at the time we used to um you know be, 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 being a young person of color in london we'd get stopped by the police all the time. Like when we were going going about trying to study, trying to get to university, we'd get stopped and be like, where's the drugs? You know, where's this? And it was so hard, like emotionally, you know, uh, and, and also just, just being being put through that, you know, the whole sort of trauma of it. And then when I graduated, I actually did a, a degree in uh, business and human resource management at the time. And, you know, <clears throat> all these great consultancy companies. And I thought, you know, I want to make a difference. I want to do something different. And funny enough, the, the police came up at the time, right? They were, they were recruiting. And I bumped into someone at one of the recruitment fairs that you have at university. And they're like, join the police. And I thought, you know what? I've got real issues with you as an organization. However, I also acknowledge I don't have a voice sitting on the outside. I'm going to join the police service and be on the inside to drive that change and make a difference. So I joined the police and I spent I think about nine years in the police service where I went on to head up the equality, diversity and human rights department for the police. But that's where it started from the want to want to make a difference because of my personal lived experiences. But then understanding that difference can only happen when you're part of the system that creates inequality or, you know, discrimination and so on. OK, and so that's this. I won't double click, but I want to make a reference. So. A, you were born in Kenya. Yeah. Right? So, mm -hmm. it's, it's, when 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 you have that concept of diversity, right? Forget the equity and inclusion portion for a second. What does diversity? Well, I'm, I'm gonna throw it back in. What does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean to you as you're shaping the thoughts and visions around this in a global setting? Completely. Yeah. So, so I mean, it's you know, it's fascinating. Growing up in Kenya, um, we we. There's so many differences. Kenya is such a diverse country for anyone uh, or, or who's listening, who's been to Kenya, has so many elements of diversity. And, you know, we were we were really and truly people valued the differences we had. We celebrated differences together. Um, and I, I really didn't know much about what diversity was because it was natural. It was you could be your authentic self. There wasn't a specific sort of, you know, way of looking at it. And then when I came to the UK, um, very early on, people started trying to call out different elements of my diversity. It was like, hey, you know, are you 
are you you know south asian and, and and the south asian people wanted me to join them and and then people were like you know are you muslim and the muslims wanted me to join them and i'm like hey like i'm all these things and more you know oh, that's not just yeah. the only thing um and and that was really interesting for me because to me diversity is not one thing you know intersectionality means there's so many layers to my authentic unique identity um and which go beyond you know the external ones those are important but there's internal elements non visible elements and i I truly believe that for us in, in our workplaces, in society, if we're truly going to value diversity, we must understand those unique identities because no two people are the same. There's no stereotypical, you know, these two people, they look the same. So, you know, they, they're going to have exactly the same characteristics or even the same wants, needs, challenges or opportunities. So that piece is really, really important. And then the equity piece um, which I think is another really important area because equity people misunderstand a lot of times, right? They they assume equity is about, you know, advantage and one group's getting something that I'm not getting, almost that Robin Hood situation, right? We steal from one group and give to another, which is completely false. You know, diversity or equity is about leveling the playing field. It's giving the same, op we know historically, not everyone has the same access whether it's to opportunities in the workplace or in society more generally. So equity is about leveling that. We don't give advantage. No one wants to. I don't want to be you don't want to be anyone's you know, token hire or yep. token person. Right. We want to be unique and valued for that. But equity does that. And then the inclusion piece is, of course, we want to be included. But I do think we need to go beyond inclusion and really create a sense of belonging where people can be their authentic self, you know, can give a different opinion, don't have to adapt to the group thinking and, you know, all those elements um, that, that, that really will drive change because we want those diverse ways of thinking, you know, ideas, you know, that will help us be better workplaces of the future. You know, earlier you mentioned that you saw how the system was working and you said, I'm going to be a change agent but for me to become a change agent, I have to get into the system, be a part of the system to help foster. What would you, how would you describe your leadership style? That's a really, really good question. Um, so, so I think, you know, I, I, I realized because of that system that I went into the police service at that time, which was very resistant to change. And, you know, even if you look at the statistics in the UK at the time, from a diversity perspective, they weren't great. And unfortunately, there's been a report that came out a couple of weeks back in the UK that said there's still, you know, uh, elements of racism, sexism and you know, homophobia in the police service. So when I joined that system, one of the things I learned about leadership is that if I'm going to drive change, I must bring people along on that journey. And bringing people along on the journey means that it must be done in a way that I'm bringing them to understand a point of view, to understand the impact of what's going on. Because, you know, we tend to sometimes in the diversity space only speak to the ones or, you know, we, we do things that really encourage the people who are already on board. They're already there. You know, they're already ready to sort of, you know, fly the flag for us, so to speak. But we need to bring everyone on that journey. And that requires patience, resilience, because the amount of times and this is the other thing, right? You can go on my LinkedIn and it looks all successful. Uh, and, you know, there is some successes there. But you know how many times I've failed? It's, if I had a LinkedIn page for the amount of times I've failed, I'm pretty sure I'd crash LinkedIn. <laughs> I can't have the amount of times I've got something wrong or, you know, not managed to achieve something. But what it requires is resilience, right? So as a leader, when you get, you know, when, 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 when something goes wrong or when something doesn't go your way, how do you adapt and try again? And that skill is so important. And in the DNI space, more than anything, is separating the emotional connection to creating a business imperative for what you're trying to champion. Because it is hard, right? Because emotionally, you might have gone through something, or you know, when you're talking about, let's say, racial equity, you might have personal experiences. So when someone says, no, I don't think it's important, or I don't think that's something we should be driving, it's like a personal attack. But the moment you let your emotions come into the conversation, then you're an activist and then you're not positioning it from a business perspective. So I'm I'm a huge believer that we, we should position things and, you know, do it from a business perspective. But the leaders need to be resilient in, in D&I. We, you know, we need to be thinking about the business narrative and how to take it forward from a business perspective um, and education. Right. I always say to everyone, ask me anything. 
anything you want. This is a safe space. I'm happy to have discussions. I'm happy for us to disagree, but you know, I, I want you to 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 really be uh, uh, you know in that position that we can have those conversations. Even my staff, by the way, my staff teach me stuff. I'm not you know I, I I've done DNI for a long time or DEI, but there's, there's new generations, you know, you know, things change, like my time to now, it's completely different. But I'm always ready to learn, right? As a leader, showing vulnerability is one of the biggest, biggest skills. And I learned this during the pandemic and, you know, uh, uh, even other times that being a leader who can show that vulnerability, who can say, I haven't got all the answers, but you know what, Charles, what can I do? That's a true leader or a leader that shows even a bit about themselves. And sorry, this is my last point on this, but no, the leader, no leaders who leaders give, you know, they do statements, they send um, newsletters, all that kind of stuff. And it's all corporate. No one identifies with that. I make sure that I bring my personal who I am into any communication I do, because we as humans connect with humans. So if I said, hey, you know, I took my my kids to the park on the weekend and then let's talk about business, it humanizes me as a leader. And that's what people want. People who are like them or people they can relate to is the people they believe in. You know, two, 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 two points before we move on to the next. You bring your authentic self. That, that Everything you just said, said to me, I'm bringing my authentic self. I need you to see me as me so we can have a conversation. We can be similar. Yeah. But the point about diversity is that we could be similar in, in, in look, feel, etc. But we have a diversity of thought that allows for us to challenge each other in a safe exactly. space to get us to the best conclusion, not to get you to my conclusion or to your conclusion, but to the best conclusion. Exactly. And, I, and that's that resonates. Right. Because a lot of times you get leaders who who actually this is the segue into my next question. Right. Um, who shape teams around them that really are agreeable with what they think about. And that's not diversity of thought. No, that's that's no. that's confirmation bias at that point, right? Completely. But moving to that next point about building teams, you build or you have a charge to build teams that are international and global in nature, mm-hmm. right? And so I have this theme called, you know, representation matters, right? We talked early on about, uh, off camera about, how we both felt earlier in our careers and maybe sometimes now where people ask us questions like you want me to answer that for all black men <laughs> right exactly. you want me to do no that question by its own merit uh has to be broader etc and so when representation matters and skills and knowledge matter how do you go about building a team that's global in nature that has to deal with issues that are not just male female young old it's okay. you know religion, it's country, you know, uh, government based, etc. How do you go yeah. about managing that? Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things is um, dropping the dominant culture mentality. Now, what I mean by that is many times, you know, when we're based in the US or the UK, which are perceived or seen as dominant cultures, we go around the world trying to, you know, um, either take our message from a dominant cultural perspective that we know it, right? We're the right ones and we will tell you how we should do this. Or we recruit or we build teams based on our what our preferences are. And the truth is, if we're going to truly build global teams and global understanding and understand the nuances in different countries, regions, you know, markets, we have to really go in with an open mind and be ready to you know, have teams that think differently to us, act differently to us. I I worked in Germany when I worked for uh, Adidas and that was fascinating for me. Culturally, they're very different to the British, you know, and and I I had to adapt. I did not expect them to adapt to me because that's that's not what it's about. Similarly, when I speak to our teams in India or, you know, Japan or Brazil or, you know, Mexico, they are different. But the expectation is not for them to become me. It's for us to meet halfway. And that piece is so important when we think about global teams is understanding that and also understanding within that they're on their own journey. Right. We might be more advanced in certain things. We're not perfect. We both know that, like, you know, whether it's the US, the UK, we're not perfect in what we have. But what we shouldn't be doing is, you know, going in with either the savior mentality where we're going (laughs) to save the world um, or trying to correct them when when they're on their own journey. We should guide them, support them. 
but it is about letting them live out their journey of going down the inclusion path, taking them on those, you know, giving them the pointers, the tools they need, but they have to own that journey and, and drive that journey of, of, of inclusion. But it's, it's, it's huge. And, you know, I've learned so much over the years around, you know, um, different cultures, different, you know, things that matter, things that I wouldn't have thought are problematic in other countries are still, you know, problematic or things that I took for granted that they don't have in other, other regions or other countries, but also understanding there's other countries who are doing some things better than us. And acceptance of that is huge that, you know, we're not, you know, we're, we're not perfect ourselves. You talked earlier about taking emotion out mm -hmm. and looking at it from a business hat. How do you go about measuring the success of your programs that you have to implement in that help drive the bottom line for Warner Brothers Discovery? Yeah, so you know, for us, the success of programs is 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 in a few different ways. The measurement, right? Um, I'm a big believer that we don't do programs just for the sake of that we're running a program. And you know, we run some groundbreaking programs. For me, what's really important is when people go through our programs that we create opportunities for them at the end. Because if we're lifting them up, training them, giving them the knowledge, you know, that they need or the you know the the experience that they need, then how do we ensure? that they're able to take that knowledge, that experience that they've gained, and then, you know, really practice it. So it's about looking at opportunities for them. And when I say opportunities, it's not, you know, I'm not precious that they should only have opportunities within Warner Brothers Discovery. If they go to one of our uh, competitors, one of the other, you know, media, media companies, great, as long as we've created their future workforce. And I say future because people move around, right? If you have a good experience, if you were trained, by Warner Brothers Discovery today. And even if you didn't, you know, you ended up working at one, one of the other organizations, at some point you, you might come back and you will value the company that started your career. But it is really the measurement piece is about that conversion into actual opportunities. Um, and I believe that even when it comes to internal programs, development programs for internal staff, as well as the external pipeline programs that we run, uh, across across our industry, because even internally, if you're putting someone, and I've been on these programs in my career, right, where I've gone on a program for people of color, and you know, I've been told how great I am, and I'm getting all the training, and then I finish the program, and I'm told, go back to your seat and just sit there and continue doing what you're doing, and I'm like, huh? You, yeah, you, you, you told me I'm top talent, you know, I'm I'm this great thing, and I've left those companies that did that. So for me. With any programs that we run, it's really important that then if we're saying you're top talent, then you have the opportunities that top talent have. We are in a macro environment right now that is global in nature because the U.S. starts to make interest rate rise. It, it, it affects everybody else downstream, right? Say the unemployment rate is too low. Hey, we have to raise the unemployment rate. That starts to spur companies making hard, tough decisions. You also have consolidations of organizations. You guys just went through a merger, et cetera. And so if you put that in, and I don't want to, I'm not keying in on Warner Brothers in this case, but just the bigger ecosystem, no. right? If you, when you start to factor all of that in and say that now people are looking at revenue, but more importantly, or just as important, they're looking at the bottom line and saying, hey, where are our expenses at? How do we, uh, you know, uh, maximize profits? Sometimes programs get cut and it seems like at least I've seen more articles coming out that, you know, top of the, 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 the chopping block are diversity programs. Mm -hmm. How do we better educate or is there a need to better educate corporate leaders that as you start to chop these programs, you're in essence chopping that diversity arm of thought, not mm -hmm. just of people. What would, how do you lean in on that? Definitely. So, so I think the first thing just to acknowledge with, with the, you know, the whole sort of global financial crisis, you know, whatever is going on and the restructures, mergers, you know, uh, within many organizations is now more than ever, it's important to have a lens on diversity. What you can't do is during this period of time, go backwards. And, you know, at least with us, I know I'm quite proud that we did a lot of concise efforts during our uh, you know, merger to make sure that we don't go back from a diversity lens. And, you know, we, we, we did it in that respect. I think with the programs and everything else, it's understanding why we did them. And this goes back really to the uh, sort of initial point I was making. If you initially pitch these programs as critical to your business, really important for from a business perspective, they're not going to get chopped. 
yeah. right? But if you pitch them as a, hey, here's a nice thing to do to help this poor group of people, they're going to get chopped because nice to do things during financial difficulties for companies get axed. That's the truth. So I think it goes back to the foundations of why or why you pitched or what you pitched them as. And if even if they were pitched as the wrong thing, it's important at this point to highlight why they're so important from a business perspective to continue the success of the organization. That's where those metrics come in as well to say exactly. hey, this is what you're gaining as we go through these different programs so that it does tie back to the bottom line. Exactly. For those who have and potentially will be affected and you start to, you know, a, a, as those programs take effect, what do you say to those individuals who have been affected as they have to start to either reinvent themselves, especially reinventing themselves with their competition not just being a person across the aisle from them but also now with the technology that we have in place <laughs> you have you know artificial intelligence you have a, a f different forms of automation what advice are you giving individuals who are, you know as they start to retool themselves as they want to re-enter into the corporate environment yeah so so i think you know one of the things i've learned in my my career uh, has been don't limit yourself to one industry. As you know, I've worked in nearly every industry there is out there from public sector to sports brand to consultancy to media. And it's been great because there's so many transferable skills. There's so many different elements of learning that you can take and it keeps you continuously reinventing yourself as well, right? Because you're you're thinking in a new place. It's exciting. So I think that's the biggest thing. As people think about what's next for them, it's no, there's no point in limiting yourself to one area and understanding that what you have, the knowledge, the experience, they're all transferable skills. And then to the piece around tech, tech is only as good as the people who design it. So, you know, tech's great. And, and I had this conversation with someone a couple of weeks back where they're like, you know, as a result of tech, we're going to reduce biases and, you know, we're going to get better at diversity. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, OK. Uh, I'm like, only if your tech is designed by diverse, underrepresented individuals who give you different perspectives. Otherwise, you're still going to end up with products and technology that's biased. Yeah. And that that's the big piece. So there is there is that piece even within the tech space. There is the place to bring in a different way of thinking, a different idea, different lived experiences, different elements of diversity to make the tech world better. So so I think there's those two elements. It's about you know going beyond what you beyond your comfort zone. But there's also the piece about understanding that even with advancements in technology, there's always going to be a place for someone who brings a different perspective. I'm, I'm going to get you out of here on, on, on just two other items, right? Um, how do you recharge? You're all over the place. You're in, you know, we said <laughs> global. Global means global, right? It, what, it does. How many countries are you in in a, in a quarter? You know, how do a you lot. <laughs> and, and, and recharge so that way you're not burning out. Yeah, so so I think you know it's 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 interesting for me. Um, you know that I, I try to do a lot of different things. I mean, recently I've started doing going out for walks. As much as that sounds stereotypical, but I I, I just felt the need that because of traveling, I'm always eating out of you know room service and on planes and stuff. So I'm really trying to get healthier, and I'm trying to just do that, just walking around outside, you know, without any specific agenda. Because I also realized that I sit on my phone 24-7, like before bed, wake up in the morning. So that gives me that, you know, that freedom to just almost switch off completely. Um, but the other big thing for me personally to reach out, I mean, I've got a family, I've got young kids, spend a lot of time with them. But I like to spend time with people I grow, you know, grew up with, areas I, you know, grew up in. Because one of the things with that is I feel I am truly 110% my authentic self. These people don't judge me based yeah. on the title I hold, the car I drive, or any of those things. These are people I knew from childhood, and I can really feel like I can let go and be me. Um, and that's a recharge moment because it reminds me of how far I've come, um, but also how much I valued the very people that brought me to where I am. I want to double click on that for two seconds. Because they're the ones who can give you, your, you know, the nickname that you had when you were seven years exactly. old. Exactly. Right. Um, do you find in some cases, though, that some some individuals change a little and you have to sort of reset them and say, I'm still a seat, y'all. <laughs> or I I'm do. still the same nickname that you gave me before. Don't change because you see all of this stuff over here. 
take that throw that away completely completely and and you know th there's that piece also and i'm also very conscious myself not to go in with this you know the savior mentality and now because i i you know broke through from that sort of uh what might be perceived as you know a, I, I was more successful of the lot that now I go back and give you know advice to everyone that hey why are you still doing that why are you still doing this so I I, I think it's it's it, it's that conscious decision we make I never give advice I don't give business advice there I don't tell them what to do with their lives you know even the ones who are doing the same thing I left them 20 odd years 25 <laughs> years ago doing but I appreciate that that's their journey you know and that's their journey and and, and that's what it is with, with, with mine you know there's the occasion when you know, they, they one of them might have gone on Google or something like that and seen something or a picture, and and it's a, it's a fun moment for them, right? I think in, internally it's a it's it's a moment of um, you know um, also celebration and you know the acknowledgement that someone who we grew up with was able to you know make it in the corporate world. Um, but but yeah, I I do always say that you know I am still the same person who grew up here, the same person who used to walk around these streets with you, ride bikes, you know that kind of thing that's not changed no matter how many you know how what i wear what i drive all those things are secondary the, the person deep down inside is that same person that you grew up with so through all of your successes well earned you had an opportunity to meet the queen I Tell did. Us, you know we're gonna leave you on this one because you know they actually had the show the queen which you know my wife and i watched you know several episodes but I know you told me that there were some fascinating characteristics about meeting the queen that, you know, would you be able to share? Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. So, so you know, um, when I, when I got my uh, MBE, um, so it's an honor for, for those that might not know. Uh, that's you know that the queen can give upon uh, people. So it could be an MBE, it could be a knighthood, you could become a sir, like some of the the musicians and and famous actors, or an MBE. Um, and when I got it, you know, there's a ceremony that you go through and, you know, they they, they do about 80, 90 people a, a on the day. Um, but it was fascinating for me because, you know, she she actually took the time to have conversations um, with each and every individual and really asked them a bit more about them, you know, what they do. And, and that was fascinating because you can imagine, I mean, I, you know, I can have conversations, but, you know, you tell me to have 80 conversations in one day and know each and every person's background, what they've done what their successes have been, why they're here. It's very hard to memorize that. But she did a great job of, you know, doing that. Um, same with, you know, Prince Charles, who's king uh, king now. Um, he He's just as good. You know, I met him as well um, and it, just as good and, and did exactly the same thing. So it was fascinating just going through that and, and you know, having that sort of uh, being able to go through the ceremony. And more so, if I'm being very honest with you, the ceremony for me, because I know there's many people who you know look at honors like the you know becoming a member of the british empire which is what the nb stands for um as you know almost uh, a difficult thing to accept because of the history of the british empire um and i remember at the time when i got it there was a lot of people who were like well you know why older people from my communities were like no you can't accept that from them you know after everything they did to us so you know that that kind of view in my view was it's a great achievement for us and for the younger generations coming up to know that we can achieve anything and we can be recognized for this. Um, and, you know, whether we look at the British Empire as doing good or bad, and I know there's numerous arguments of it, it is it is part of our history. And, and I, I think being able to accept something from that very empire, which might have been perceived or seen as, you know, some of the you know negativity that happened to my people, others who look like me, other communities, I think that in itself is a great stand uh, for the community. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, it goes back to that same phrase we said earlier about representation matters for those individuals in your community, current or past, who have the ability to see you get that honor. If it's an inspiration for them. You inspire somebody. Right. And, and so, you know, name it Atlanta. This is a Sif Sadiq. <laughs> Now you understand why we needed him on this show, right? You know, I, see if I, I appreciate all of the knowledge and wisdom that you shared with our audience. Um, we're going to keep an eye on you, keep the continued success, keep being Thank a you. bright beacon of light to individuals, not just in the DEI space, but just in leadership and and the various cultures that you represent in general, because we need that. So I Thank appreciate you. coming on for us. 
have a wonderful career. <laughs> I'm Thank pretty you. Thank you so much.